good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Anna Silva, and I'm a senior researcher at the Norwegian Institute for NATO Research, so usually known as NINA. Uh, and I'm here today to moderate this session on connectivity, barriers, and solutions, together with Abe. So, Abe, maybe you can introduce yourself. Thank you very much. I'm Abe Schneider. I'm a mechanical engineer from Nettel Energy in the United States. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, it's a great honor to help moderate this panel on con connectivity. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer working in the design of turbines safe for fish to pass through, um, <laughs> which hopefully fits into this connectivity theme. Uh, and and just some practical information. As you know, there are uh, different uh, sessions running at the same time. So we're going to ask the speakers to try to keep on time. So that will be very important. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to hear all the speakers. I think it will be like a fantastic and a very exciting uh, session. Uh, so with this meeting, and to not take more of, of the time, I'll introduce our first speaker. So Sebastian Strenzel. Something like that. I'm trying my best here. Uh, so Sebastian is a freshwater ecologist and he works at NORS. And uh, he basically focuses research on um, uh, restoration and hydropower mitigations. And today he's going to talk a little bit about fish passes in Norway. Thank you. Thank you. So my presentation was uh, prepared in cooperation with Anna from Nina and Martine from Milieu Direktrate and some colleagues at NORS. And just as a little background, so we all know over the whole world, fish populations have been reduced due to fragmentation. And also in Norway, there is an aim to uh, have control, uh, to, to map uh, artificial barriers and to improve connectivity. And what's quite special in Norway is that, uh, compared to the rest of Europe, that additionally to passages past a lot of artificial barriers, you have many barriers past, uh, many passages past uh, natural barriers. Here is uh, one uh, example. Sheens Elva, one of the larger rivers in Norway, which, uh, where the delta uh, was partially closed for uh, timber, floating uh, in the 1900s already, and then fully closed for hydropower in the 1970s with fish passages that only worked for, ma for mainly uh, salmon and uh, some uh, sea trout. And after a, a vertical slot pass was installed uh, a couple of years ago, also, sea lamprey can uh, return to this river now. So, uh, this uh, study was uh, built on the database from Milieu Direktorate and is the database on 536 fish passages, which was uh, updated based on expert judgment by the local authorities in 2020. And 430 and 433 of these passages were then analyzed uh, further because for the other ones we did not have enough information. So this is uh, building on extensive work that Hans Petter did in his time. And we basically come to similar conclusions, but with uh, bigger numbers. And we also looked into differences to the assessment of the local authorities with uh, expert judgment on the same passages that we did, 22 passages, and the deviations are actually quite small for most of the parameters, but uh, with an just guesstimation of efficiency, we uh, actually had a worse scoring than local authorities, and also for technical condition, which mainly is uh, because a lot of the concrete was very worn down already, or the intake structure was very uh, in a very bad condition. But also, like for example, here I just picked up down, uh, picked out safe downstream passage. We came to very similar values, just that the local authorities had uh, better information on one of the passages. So we can say that uh, fish passage has been a big success. There is almost three and a half thousand of river kilometers opened or reopened. By, uh, by fish passages. 
and 65% of these passages are past uh, natural barriers, and the rest are uh, past artificial barriers, which uh, have reopened 1,400 uh, kilometers of river stretch. And so we can say that on average, a uh, passage past an artificial barrier opens about 11 kilometers of river stretch, and past a natural barrier about six kilometers. And uh, the clearly dominating fish pass type in uh, Norway is the pool and weir pass with top notches. And you can say that a big see that a big share of them has a height difference between the weirs of about 50 centimeters. And for the next, uh, next biggest share, is, uh, we do not know the diff height differences. Um, and the first uh, fish passages were built in the 1870s in Norway, mainly by salmon lords or local landowners that wanted to increase salmon habitat for fishing. So it was a big uh, cultivation uh, uh, thing in the early days. And then you had this boost of fish passage building uh, in the 1960s and 70s past natural barriers and 70s and 80s past uh, artificial barriers. And these early barriers, it often really was just blasted uh, pools in, in the rocks. But what's also quite uh, interesting when we remember what Ulrich was presenting yesterday, with a lifetime of uh, concrete constructions of about 30 to 60 years in uh, connection to this, we see that a big tail of these fish passages sooner or later will come to the end of its lifetime and will need uh, maintenance. And this also brings us to today's technical condition, which was uh, assessed bad or very bad for uh, 16 passages past artificial barriers and 35 passages past natural barriers, with very bad meaning uh, it's totally gone or filled up with sediments. And we did a rough calculation and, uh, on the costs uh, to here I just uh, picked out artificial barriers. So the 16 passages have an elevation, total elevation difference of 74 meters. And with uh, this uh, cost data that uh, Ulrich presented yesterday, we have an average cost of 750,000 crowns per meter altitude for rebuilding which brings us to about 56 million crowns for rebuilding of these uh, artificial bar barriers, uh, of these passages past artificial barriers, and another 15 million for maintenance of these with uh, moderate uh, technical condition. But the question is, do we actually want to rebuild today's passages? Which brings me to the next point, which is uh, passability. And uh, this is based on Hans Betterfeldstadt's uh, report from 2018, which is maybe the closest we are to a national guideline on fish, fish passage in uh, Norway. Sorry, this is Nick. And uh, Nick. on the species me? that are occurring downstream of the fish passage, the passage type, and uh, the height difference between uh, pools. And we then find that, based on, uh, on this report and the data we have, only 15% of uh, the passages, uh, we can say that they are passable. For 47%, we can assume that they are not passable for all species and uh, size classes on site. And for another 38%, we do not know. Oh, yeah. And should I just continue or should I wait until? Yeah, yeah. yeah and it's uh, mainly eel, lamprey, and inland fish that are uh, blocked for migration, and juvenile salmon and trout, especially with uh, pool and weir passes and high height differences. So the question is do we actually want to rebuild to? And in my opinion, this is totally fine when you are talking about natural passages where you want to bring adult salmon up for cultivation or uh, for uh, spawning. But when we talk about artificial barriers, we should really think about if we do not, uh, if we should not look into all species and size classes. 
Um, there is also 16% of the artificial barriers that are uh, not operated during the whole year, but just during salmon migration. And for another 54%, we do not know how they are operated. And here you can see it's not only a problem for fish, but there is also a beaver that did not make it through the passage here. And uh, this brings us to the next question. So we have these uh, 505 fish passages, but we also have about four, more than 4,000 dams in a national dam database. And uh, I just did a little uh, illustration on showing how many dams we have and the fish passages, fastest dams. Here you see river stretches with left, less than 5% uh, gradient based on the national elevation model. And that then when you zoom yourself into random uh, dams, you see that many of them have a long free-flowing stretch upstream and downstream of the barrier. And the barrier is uh, definitely not passable. And there is this, this is mainly occurring in the inlands, where you have this phenomenon of nah, which is uh, not anadromous here, where you have, uh, additionally to all these 4,000 dams, a lot of uh, weirs and sills that were built for uh, maintaining uh, the water level and aesthetics, and are not passable in many cases, or secondary intakes, that uh, potentially are fish eaters and uh, bone-dry stretches uh, downstream. And uh, downstream migration definitely is also an issue for the, uh, for the dams in, within the fish, fish passage database, with about 19% of artificial barriers uh, being potentially unsafe. And also, we can also, uh, or probably we should also treat the 47% where no information is available as uh, unsafe until we know better. And uh, I think I will hop over this uh, good practice part because we saw this one yesterday already, and also this one yesterday already. But we can uh, conclude that um, there's a lot of good things happening. Uh, uh, in the last couple of years, after this uh, database was uh, updated, a lot of uh, uh, really strict uh, guides, uh, guiding from the authorities on new projects and also upgrading of existing ones. And this is not only small scale power plants, but also larger ones. And as uh, takeaways, uh, really need to have a better overview over uh, artificial barriers, also uh, smaller ones like seals and weirs. And we clearly could show that uh, most of our passages are built for adult salmon and trout, working very well for them. But for artificial barriers, we should also think of other species and uh, uh, think of uh, operating these uh, passages all over the year and not only when adult species are migrating. There is a big need for refurbishments. Sometimes easy solutions is possible. And in many cases, uh, we should build uh, better than today. And we should uh, think up and downstream migration. And we probably should also think downstream migration if there is no upstream migration on site. So with that, I want to thank uh, Milieu Directorat for uh, the project and cooperation. And the local authorities for a lot of effort uh, in uh, supplementing data and fish baths for uh, research funding.